This fall, as we read through the Gospel of Mark, we focus on Jesus and the many dimensions of his being and his presence and God's healing power in him. And today we hear this familiar story from the 10th chapter of Mark's Gospel, a familiar story where Jesus welcomes the children. Listen now to God's word from Mark chapter 10, beginning at the 13th verse. People were bringing little children to Jesus in order that he might touch them. And the disciples spoke sternly to them. But when Jesus saw this, he was indignant and said to them, Let the children come to me. Do not stop them. For it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God as a little child will never enter it. And he took them up in his arms. He laid his hands on them, and he blessed them. This is the word of the Lord. At the Matisse exhibit at the Indianapolis Museum of Art, there is a very short video that shows the great artist Matisse later in his life sitting in an easel with his grandson sitting next to him. It shows Matisse with bold strokes and a few simple lines capturing in a series of, of three portraits something of the essence of his grandson's character. Bold strokes and a few simple lines. Jesus had a great gift for using simple words and common things to paint holy mysteries. He uses ordinary situations and plain gestures to tell the gospel. He compares the kingdom of God to a net thrown into a sea, to a pearl of great price, to a treasure in a field, to yeast that causes bread to rise, to a tiny seed that grows into an enormous bush. He compares the kingdom of God to commonplace activities like a, a man going on a journey, a woman looking for a lost coin, a farmer planting seed, and a shepherd seeking lost sheep. These images that are so fixed in our minds are powerful because I think in part their simplicity. They are simple, but they do not oversimplify the gospel. And each one gives us, as it is often said, a window into the world of the gospel. Gives us insight into the very character of Jesus and of God. One of the most compelling images of the kingdom of God is drawn in the simple words and actions of Jesus when he welcomes the children. Did you hear it? He takes them into his arms. He places his hand upon them. And he blesses them. And then he says, let the little children come to me and do not stop them, for it is to such as these that the kingdom of God belongs. Truly I tell you, unless you receive the kingdom like a little child, you shall not enter it. Well, what do these simple words and gestures mean? It's certainly a word about receiving the gifts of God as freely as they are given. It is about receiving without guile or pretense or any sense of merit. You know, an unexpected gift given to an adult may elicit such response as, Oh, no, you shouldn't have. Or, Oh, oh, that's just too much. Words that sometimes hide a deeper thought such as, well, it's about time. <laughs> you know, I've earned this. It's the least you could do. But a child, a child simply reaches out and grabs it with joy without question. To receive the kingdom is to reach out and grab it and receive it without question. The kingdom does not belong to those who argue over greatness, who strive to get ahead of others. Those who enter the kingdom are not like the Pharisee who, who prayed long prayers in the temple, who was proud of his own righteousness, who expected a first-class ticket, concierge level, all the way to the pearly gate. 
No, the kingdom belongs to the publican who beats his breast and declares his own unworthiness, who repents of his sin and receives the unexpected grace of God with gratitude. The kingdom belongs to the child without guile. The kingdom belongs to you and me. The simple words and ordinary gestures of Jesus say something more, however, I think. And the clue lies in the action of the disciples to stop these children from getting to Jesus. The very ones who ought to understand what the kingdom is all about are the very ones who are trying to keep people away from Jesus. The ones who are getting in the way of the gospel. People are bringing children to Jesus to bless him. And the disciples, the disciples are like the guards and tackles on the offensive line. They want to keep the wrong people from getting to Jesus. The disciples rebuke them and speak harshly to them. And Jesus has a word to say to them. What's wrong with letting children get to Jesus? Well, to understand the situation, we have to understand something of the nature of childhood in the ancient world and drop some of our modern Western notions about childhood. Today, children are cherished. They're a source of delight. Childhood extends many more years than, than it did in biblical times. And if you have any adult children, you may think it's going to last forever. In our best moments in our culture, we see childhood as a special time of, of growth and experiment and discovery, preparation for living responsible adult lives. Children just need time to play and to experience the wonder of life. We delight in the birth of babies and baptisms and birthday parties. And we keep pictures of our children and our grandchildren on our desk and tables and in our wallets and pocketbooks and on our Facebook pages. Children are vulnerable and need to be protected. And it's our deep sense of the value of children that, that leads us to an equally profound anguish when children are neglected or abused today. But in the ancient world, well, yes, children were a blessing, but they did not have the same status or the rights of children today. Many children did not survive childhood, and it was an accepted Roman practice to put an un unwanted child out there exposed to the elements to die. Children were considered property to be exploited for the economic benefit of the family, and childhood lasted a very short period of time, maybe to 11 or 13 or 15, when it was time to go to work or to get married. Children were rarely represented in art, and when they were, they were like little adults. Children were considered least in importance, the last and not the first. So when Jesus welcomes the children, Jesus reverses the social order. He upsets the culturally entrenched value system. With a simple gesture and with common words, he challenges the way people think about the nature of God and our standing before God. Jesus, in welcoming the children, is welcoming the powerless and the vulnerable who are represented by these children. God does not place the same value that we do on wealth or power or social standing. Our standing before God is not based on anything that we have done, but is based solely on the unmerited love and grace and mercy of God for each one of God's children in this world. It's based not on who we are, but who God is. And so when we move beyond our romantic and idealized notions about childhood, we recognize that children are often the ones who know hurts they cannot express, betrayals that they internalize, and painful experiences that they have pushed out of conscious memory. They're not so different from us. And yet Jesus welcomes all of these. Jesus welcomes us. 
For this is the great God of Scripture who, as Hannah and Mary said, brings down the powerful and lifts up the powerless, who brings down the mighty and lifts up the lowly. And welcoming children, Jesus is symbolically welcoming the lowly, the forgotten, the outcast. He's saying that the kingdom in me belongs to the hungry and the hurting and the hopeless. Think about the Scripture we heard read from the book of Kings. The prophet Isaiah, uh, the prophet uh, Elijah goes to a town called Zarephath that belonged to Sidon, a foreign town, and there he encounters a widow and her son. It is the days of a great famine, and the widow only has a little bit of meal and oil left, and she's going to bake a cake and eat it and then lie down to die. But she's willing to share it with the prophet Elijah, and because of that, God's compassion flows through her simple gesture of sharing. And God gives to her a cruise of oil and a jar of meal that will never run out as long as the famine lasts. And then her son is suddenly taken with illness, and the widow wonders, Elijah, have you come to bring disaster and curse upon me and upon my house? And the boy is at death's door. The boy has died. And he scoops up the boy, he carries him up to his room, and he prays out to God for the boy's life. And he lies down upon the boy three times, and God restores the boy to life. And she knows. Because of that, that simple act of compassion, that Elijah is a man of God and, and Elijah speaks the truth and the God of Israel is the true God. And at the very heart of the universe is this compassion of God not only for Israel but even for the foreigners, the enemies of Israel. When the AIDS epidemic first erupted in our country, the South Carolina Christian Action Council, which was the state council of churches, called on, on congregations to respond, and they created these AIDS care teams, and they trained them how to work with, with those who had in, contracted this terrible disease. The congregation I serve formed several of these teams, and they worked with people who had very little support or care. Because, as we know, in those days there was so much fear about AIDS that people did not even want to do the simple gesture of touching someone with that disease. Many were kicked out of their homes, flat, broke, and homeless. Our care teams worked with several men and helped them find a place to live. They prepared food for them. They took them to doctor's appointments and even simply sat beside the bed of the dying and held their hands so they did not die alone and abandoned, forsaken by God and others. You know, it makes a difference when you die with the sense of your life is enfolded and enwrapped in the arms of Jesus. God has given us simple, ordinary words to speak. That when we speak them in the name of Jesus, they bring profound hope and healing to others. God has given us hands and faces that we can use to express this astonishing love of God for all the children of the earth and the gestures and the expressions that we give, and ordinary acts and common things given to the most unexpecting and yet needful people. In his book, My Bright Abyss, the poet Christian Wyman offers a theological and poetic meditation upon his own long experience with cancer and his struggle with his faith. 
Not long after his diagnosis, Wyman and his wife, who live in New York City, found themselves on Sunday morning in the little congregational church down the street from where they lived. There was something in that experience of being in worship again after so many years of, of not being in worship that stirred something deep within him that he did not even recognize. They filled out the visitor slip, but they hoped they wouldn't have to actually speak to the pastor, so they slipped out the side door. During that week, Wyman and the pastor had a kind of email exchange of a variety of topics, including the, the topic of his serious illness. And one day when Wyman, that week, late in the week, was walking down the street going to catch a train, he heard a voice behind him call his name, and it was the pastor who was, lived in the same block, and he was running down the street to catch up with him, and he caught up with him, and on the way to the train... The pastor sought for words to bridge the gap between the faith of the church and Wyman's physical and spiritual struggle. Wyman writes, And I remember when we parted. There was an awkward moment of silence when the severity of my situation and our unfamiliarity with each other left us with no words to say. And in a gesture that I am sure was completely unconscious, he placed his hand over his heart just for an instant. And an empathetic expression of anguish crossed his face. I tell you, it sliced right through me. It cut through the cloud I was living in and let the plain day pour its balm upon me. And I am sure that one of those moments, it was one of those moments when we enact and reflect a mercy and a mystery that is greater than we are. When the void of God and the love of God, when incomprehensible pain and the peace that passes all understanding come together in a simple human act. And Jesus said, Let the little children come unto me, for as such as these, the kingdom of God belongs. And he took them up in his arms and he laid his hands on them and he blessed them. Amen.